Hi everyone. Uh, we'll just wait for a few more minutes, um, just whilst people join us. Sometimes people have problems um, logging in. I know we did. <laughs> so so uh, you're all coming through thick and fast, so that's what we want to see. Uh, so, okay, quickly. so let's make a start and then um, we'll We'll record this on, we're, we should be recording this and we will uh, share it on YouTube afterwards. So I know lots of people, the times didn't really work for them. So um, yeah, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Alistair Griffiths, who's um, Director of Science and Collections at the Royal Horticultural Society, which is uh, quite topical given the fact that um, uh, Chelsea Flower Show is on at the moment. Um, yeah. <laughs> so um, this is a series of webinars that we're doing, which is helping to support patients during this COVID-19 um, pandemic. We're coming out of this, but we're trying to get some, share experience from the clinicians and also from um, from external speakers. Uh, just with some ideas of how you can cope with the current situation. So um, over to you, Alison. Would you like to say a few words about your background? Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so, so, so I'm Alistair. Um, my background is basically I've been obsessed with plants since the age of four. Um, my granddad got me into, into gardening um, and then basically spent quite a lot of time in in college so spent uh, about five years uh, in college and then went on did a degree at Reading University in botany so understanding plants and then did a PhD uh, for a further five years and then I, I worked and I was one of the people that were involved in setting up the Eden project which was a fantastic project and now and now it, uh, it's all about growing plants and and doing science to help people grow the RHS. Thank you. So, I mean, I have to say that everybody knows that plants are good for you and gardening is good for you. And, and um, but then so many other things are kind of good for you, too. And um, it's quite I hadn't realized um, how important gardening and planting was. I mean, I knew it had an effect, but I didn't realize quite the impact it has. And I think a lot of work that you've done, research that you've done, actually demonstrates the the power of getting involved in gardening would you like to share some highlights yeah i mean i i think that certainly um, i'm a trustee of something called people and gardens and and that's where i first saw it at eden project basically gardening has this um amazing power in relation to um, bringing back responsibility, self-respect. It, it enables you to grow things, to have control, to see things happen. And, and there's a whole thing to do with um, stress reduction and, and psychology of, of gardening. Plus it's quite, um, it, it's, an, it's an ability of something, like I said, that you get rewarded from. Even if you fail, because you can carry on and try again, it doesn't really matter. If you fail, you can try again, do something else, and eventually you get there. So, yeah, uh, physical exercise, mental, uh, um, and and social as well. It, it's kind of one of those things that cuts across all levels. Um, and if you're obsessed about gardening and you meet someone else who's guard a gardener, um, yeah, you know, it, it's just a chat. That's all that, that, that happens. I mean, I have to share share that Alison is. Uh, has helped to write this book, uh, which is called Your Wellbeing Garden. We'll share a link with that um, uh, after the webinar and and we'll put it on YouTube. But I have to say, Alistair, this is this is absolutely remarkable. This is one of the best books I've I've read for a very 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 long time. And I, 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 there's it's a book which is full of knowledge and facts and information, but doesn't you know it's, it's not <clears throat> a heavy read it's really interesting for example i didn't realize that digging and going for a brisk walk were were basically burning up the same number of cal calories and you know if you're going for a brisk walk generally people when people go for walks and runs they go in a circle and end up where they started whereas if you were to do the same 
gardening instead, you'd actually end up with carrots and peas and beautiful flowers. So yeah. it goes back to that point that you made earlier about getting reward out of actually doing stuff which is good for you. Yeah, I mean, you, you, there is, you know, it's one of the things they used Harvard to look at the, the number of calories burned per 30 minutes. And, you know, absolutely. I mean, one thing about gardening, which is very different to all the other types of exercise, is that um, you get, once you start getting into gardening, you get into something called a bit of flaw. It's a theory that basically you get distracted. And, and honestly, you could be in your, I'm, lots of times I'm in my garden and I lose track of time. Yeah. And, and that's because you're so in the present or in the thing that you're doing that you can do activity for a longer period of time without feeling as tired mm. it's not like a sweaty gym you're in the outdoors you're getting the sunshine if it's sunny like today but at the same time you're doing gradual exercise which again for for sort of um older patients it, it has a real advantage because you know if you have a garden or a balcony or even house plants you can at least do those activities either in your home or, or very close to your home. I think that's a really good point, actually, because going back to the walking piece, so generally people don't walk for a few hours, but actually for gardening, you would, it wouldn't be unusual to garden for a few hours. And, and also, if you, I mean, this is, a, a, so I read Alison's book a few days ago, well, you don't have to read it. It's not a heavy read, but, you know, just flick through any bits that are of, of interest to you. And as a result, I've I've gone off and um, bought some vegetable seeds and and um, and actually beyond the gardening and the little pots and pl plants, actually the whole experience has been fantastic. You know, going to a garden centre, which I didn't entirely, you know, not, 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 you know, you don't, they're not necessarily always welcoming places, you know, because you don't know your way around the Latin names. And, and then, um, and I spent the afternoon just sort of potting things with my five-year-old son. And we had an absolutely wonderful mm -hmm. afternoon. And, it, and he's so keen, actually. And, and he's, he's never done it before. And then, and then at, at three o'clock in the morning, he woke up and said, Dad, 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 like, well, so what's the matter? He said, look, are, 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 are our seeds okay? Are the birds going to come and pick them? <laughs> no, no, they'll they'd be fine. They're growing, but really slowly. So I think, I think, I think um, I, for one, hadn't realised how strong that link was between health and, and gardening and not just the exercise, but, you know, if you're growing, say, if you're growing vegetables, then, or if you're growing lettuce or something you're more likely to eat healthily even if you even if you've got a carrot growing and it hasn't quite grown yet you're more likely to buy carrots you know whilst you're waiting for that one to grow so it it's it's from a personal point of view it's been transformative and and honestly i i, I it's, it's really rare that that happens and I think it is, it is definitely a transformation element. And, that, you know, there are things that you can start off with that are really, really easy. So I've got an example here. It's a bit silly. Um, but, you know, professors that can be silly, you know. So this is my uh, Chelsea Flower Show um, lady. And, 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 and to be honest, this is just an egg with a bit of, with a bit of compost in and crest seed. And, uh, you know, cut a bit of that off, egg and cress uh, seed. But for kids, you know, you can make a whole family. You can, you know, you can. And, and the beauty of cress is that you probably remember at school doing it, but it's so quick. Um, you know, it, it's a really quick thing. And, you know, planted like that. So I've, I've done that. And just recently we published a paper about seeds in space. So we took seeds up to space. We had 600,000 school kids germinating seeds in space and comparing the difference. I chose rocket because it, it germinates within a day um, and, and you can taste it. And I think, you know, I think people often think that, you know, if you garden or what, what if I fail? But again, that's part of I think it's part of a journey. I mean, failure, you don't go through life being successful. 
you, you fail all the time. And actually, but once you've overcome that obstacle, you and, and this is with growing once you've managed to grow that that prize plant or that prize thing and you and believe you me i've failed many many times then the joy is more for somewhere because you've had to struggle to get that but having said that you can also grow things and be successful instantly so awarded garden merit plants for example you know you can grow them and you'll be successful um cress it'll be very difficult to kill cress right other than eating it so I, th I think, you know, people often with allotments, they get massive allotments. Don't do that. Start with a small amount. Be successful with that and then, and then build, you know, like you build up in relation to being an athlete or if you wanted to do the marathon. It's the same with gardening. Start small, be successful, build on that and learn. And I think, yeah, it's a, it, it's a real connector for people and, as well. It's, it's like you say with your son. It, it's it's we've got sunflower competition out at the moment in the garden between them. my son was out this morning watering his plants thinking he's going to get the biggest one <laughs> so it's a real family event to be honest um and what he doesn't know is i've given him a different cultivar to mine mine's russian giant which is much bigger than <laughs> it's anyway so um, exactly I'm, sadly I, I, sadly my five-year-old knows more about gardening than me so <laughs> I, I don't have that advantage mm -hmm. But, but I, I think I think that one of the things that you kind of get across in is the fact that actually gardening isn't for people with big gardens and 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 and, and, and a wealth of experience and, and and avid gardeners who know all the Latin names actually gardening is for gardening is for everyone I suppose do you, do you want to share your thoughts on gardening in small spaces or gardening indoors yeah, I mean, gardening is gardening. Absolutely, is is for everyone, and I and I think you know, it, in inside, um, the kind of things you can you can grow. Uh, you know, there's 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 one little experiment I did, which again you could do. Um, so this is uh, popcorn from uh, Tesco, and I and I did like a, a little experiment for photosynthesis. Two weeks on this is, so one was in light. Um, and, and, and that's the joke. I had a Chinese takeaway before. That, that was a bit of a bonus. So that, that one's in light. So I just put that on the windowsill. Two weeks of germination. This is corn, really, popcorn. Just, just popcorn. Yeah, and this is uh, in the dark. And you see it's yellow. So this yellow is that it hasn't actually photosynthesized because it hasn't had the light to do it. This is really sweet because it hasn't turned the sugars into starch. Whereas this won't won't be because it, it's 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 turned those sugars into time. basic photosynthesis. You can you know you can do this with the kids yeah. in the cupboard and 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 again it's just growing because I tell you what germination and giving life us blokes can't give life in 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 that way other than germinating seeds. Giving that life is such a powerful a powerful thing. Also in the house you know a peace lily plant little little house plant. I've got a parlor, a parlor palm, um, I, and you could do this with any little plant. And I've got a light that I spike into the, uh, I think it's about five, ten pounds. Just put it into it, plugged it in, use it as a lamp, and it reflects on the roof all the palm, uh, the sort of uh, palm fronds. It's like you're in uh, a, a, a jungle. You can use tin cans as um, as for planting in relation to sort of compost and grow those. Um, another one that's really easy is this one here. This is asparagus fern. You cannot really kill this one. And then you see on my back wall there, if, you, if you're wanting to go a bit more uh, extravagant, this is plant box. So this is a new kit that basically has a reservoir. Um, and I've put ferns in, which uh, it's in a, a, and I am going to use a Latin name here, sorry, Asplenium scolopendrium. It's basically a fern that is really robust. And, and, and you can have that on the wall and, 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 and grow that on the balcony. You know, lavender, lavender is such a yeah. giver. Um, it is proven um, that it does impact on neurology and on the brain. It's a calm and relaxant. They don't quite know what the mechanism is yet, but absolutely there is um, a direct proof that it, that it does that because it's, it's now the sleep pills for lavender, which are registered um, through, through through the medicine. How many years has it been between lavender has been a bit of an aromatherapy and a, and, and, a, and a myth? So I think 
Yeah, so having lavender um, or, or, or rosemaries um, you, you can have on the balcony, you can bring it in and maybe put it on the flowers, cut the flowers and put them on, your, on the side of your bed to help help you get into a more deeper sleep. So there's a paper recently that showed that it put patients into a deeper sleep if it was yeah. put next to the bed. And in relation to, you know, if, if you're anxious, um, you, you really do sometimes not find it easy to sleep. So um, I, I certainly put it... Um, next to next to my bed when when I'm feeling a little bit anxious. Yeah, and one of the things that I discovered is is just in the last few days is actually not necessarily having a, is it vertical planting where you can basically it, it doesn't destroy the wall or anything even if you're renting somewhere. So it just you can you can have these self irrigation pots which you can put small plants in. And you can just go yeah. straight onto the onto the wall, and 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 it just changes. You know, you, people think of like putting up bits of art or wallpaper or a poster or something. Actually, plants are—it's uh, just something again that I hadn't really thought of, and actually it makes such a difference. It, it 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 does have more of an effect than than we we as a practice have realised, and um, and certainly something that we want to try to kind of. Um, um, to 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 get more people involved. Just for the patients who are here, I just want to let you know that um, allotments um, uh, are a good way not only to grow stuff and test things, but also to learn from other people. And and, and generally, allotments are welcoming organisations and people, and and it's a really good way to kind of make friends. And they, you know, actually people feel if you don't know much about plants and somebody else does, then, you know, everyone feels better. So you feel better from learning and they feel better from teaching. So, so Chiswick has some spaces available and we'll share that information that it's available to any, anybody in Hanslow. Um, so we'll share that link with you afterwards, but um, uh, you've got a, 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 a sort of a presentation. Would you, which shall I just, would you like to just quickly whistle through that? Or yeah, we'll go, go quickly because I mean, one of the things that you said, I mean, more doctors are now prescribing gardening yeah. as, 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 a method, uh, as a method because there are more and more, there's more evidence linked to the role of gardening. We did a survey of 2,000 people last, last week about what, what is, is your garden or is your um, area, your balcony, um, helping you during this lockdown in relation to your well-being because um, and and 71 percent people said that yes it was even those with with um, uh, just about three or four square meters yeah. of, of garden in the front it was 50 percent of them were being helped um, by this um, but yeah yeah crack on it's, it's, it's really interesting actually because the garden center experience was quite a pleasant one because unlike many other things um, firstly, the garden centres are open, and, and I think that was off the back of some of the work that you and your colleagues did for the, the, the government. But, but so the garden centres are open. But secondly, it's not an expensive sport. It's not like you know. Um, uh, so you, you know, you can just buy a small bit of sand and some sea, uh, uh, some um, soil and some and seeds, and they'll show you what you can and can't do and you could you know for just a five pounds or you know you could get started and they've got starter packs as well haven't they and, and yeah yeah and, and and there are a lot of affiliated societies and like you said the allotments and a lot of people you know you show an interest in gardening there are a lot of givers so there's like a massive plant swap shop. I think on Facebook, if you look at, you know, plant swap shops and stuff like that, people, I mean, I'm on social media, on tweet, uh, Twitter at Botany Rocks, they're always swapping seeds, swapping plants, because mm. it, it's quite a, it's quite a social, a social uh, thing to do. I think, I, I mean, I got into gardening. I spent, it was about four and I spent 20p on a, on a little succulent plant in a, in a coffee cup. Um, uh, it, it went all over the place and, and sort of became invasive in my little garden space. So I learned from that. But yeah, you know, it's not, it's not expensive to do. And, it, 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 and like you said, it's kind of experimentation, isn't it? So kids love to experiment with rockets and ex all the rest of it. But actually, the experiment you've just shared is also, a, you know, so you can experiment with plants. Um, so, so, so guys, um, feel free to ask any questions. There's a couple of questions coming through, but um, um, Professor Griffiths has 
prepared a, a presentation. We'll just whiz through that. I think it's uh, just to demonstrate some of the the, the evidence behind the 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 the, the, the um, uh, uh, work that he he's uh, identified and worked on himself. So bear with me one second. I'll just share my screen. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. okay, so uh, this is one of my dreams. This would be amazing if we could create uh, preventative habitats in cities and in areas because we're animals. We forget that we're animals. In fact, Charles Darwin had a lot of uh, quite a hard time um, telling people that he was related. We were related to uh, monkeys. Um, it was it was a big issue. But I think because we've been distanced, we do forget that. And um, you know, why? To move on to the next slide. And and without a doubt, if you look in 1990, so this is the number of uh, papers um, uh, with a search term gardening and mental health. And you can see, you know, from 1990 to 663, there are 8,540 papers now that reference. Uh, many of those are actually systematic reviews and there's a couple of um, RCTs, research clinical trials, that, are, that have proved this as well. So I think, you know, I think the evidence is there. I think it, it, it's, blatantly obvious that we, we should do it. This stuff is good for you. Um, it's correlated and there are some RCT. Some would argue me more, I would say, let's just get on with it because we know that there is a benefit to, to people's well-being. Okay, next one. And, and there is a challenge because um, the Wandersley and Schluster in 1998 talked of this term about plant blindness. Many people can't see plants. So, um, you know, as, as you drive, drive, as I'm driving along, and my wife was driving along in the, in the car, and I said, what do you see when you look at the side of the road? And she said, I see green blobs. And I said, well, I see different plant names, different plant uses, different habitats, different things. I see all the uses of all these different plants. I see wild garlic that I can fry up with egg. I see, you know, so I think we've, we've become more and more disconnected with nature. So next slide. And, you know, three quarters of UK children spend less time outdoors than prison inmates. So, I mean, that is, it, it, it's shocking. We are becoming more and more distanced from uh from nature and there is a term by love which was as a book another great book called um last child in the woods and it talks about nature deficit disorder which is that if us as animals don't get our habitat right then we start to have issues and this links to our autonomic nervous system because when you're in a city the way that your body physiologically reacts to that as opposed to being in the countryside or with nature around you is very different you're in a fight, flight, freeze, off on kind of mode, depending on which environment that you put yourself in. If you're in a safe environment, then you're likely to be um, balanced. Okay, so if you move, move on to the next one. Um, because I'm from the north, two for joy, magpies. Um, but 30% of children can't identify a magpie, 90% recognize a Dalek. So there we go. Um, and, and wildflower names as well, they're being removed. Um, from the English the dictionary. So again, we're distancing ourselves away from that. So next slide. Um, and we do need to safeguard ourselves from a How many tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of pounds do we put into safeguarding the panda or the orangutan, which is really important. We must protect our habitats. How many hundreds of thousands and millions of pounds are we doing destroying our habitats in cities by greying them up? by removing green stuff and, and not putting what, what we want because animals are very habitat dependent. Is it any wonder that we are suffering in the way we are with a number of these things? Now, I'm not saying that gardening, horticulture is the silver bullet. There are many other deep levels and issues around all this, but we should give more consideration to our habitat, to what surrounds us, being it indoor, being a balcony, um, and being here. So this, uh, so the next slide is what I talked about in relation to the autonomic nervous system. 
Uh, Wilson talked about the biphilia hypothesis. Eric Fromm before that was a psychologist that talked about this. Biophilia means the love of life. Um, and, and they related that to the fear of life. So um, I'm not particularly great with spiders um, and getting rid of spiders, and that's a fear. So what uh, um, Wilson and Kellett said, well, if you've got a fear of nature, snakes and stuff, evolutionary, so that you don't get bitten or you, you, know, you don't deal with it, then surely there must be a love of nature, uh, the flip side of that, where you've got danger and no danger, so if you look at this in relation to the autonomic nervous system, so in a city, I know where I'd like to rather live on those two sides, but in a city, okay, there is water, there is vegetation, and you have got food and you have got shelter, but what you haven't got is these nature things. So you get this element of um, cortisol effects. Now, we've just recently done a, a piece of research that, that links to this, which is in Salford, not Salford, in Salford, in a street, um, quite a deprived street, and, and we had a control, we put um, two tiny little planters and a single tree uh, in the street. What we did is we measured cortisol levels, um, which is in the in, uh, saliva in the mouth, that, that is a direct measure of stress. And then we also measured something called perceived stress scale. What we found, and this will be published soon, what we found was that the perceived stress scale of the individuals that had the gardens compared to the control uh, had dropped by 6%, which was equivalent to about um, eight weeks of mindfulness sessions by the NHS. And then the other, the other thing that we found was that the cortisol curve, the cortisol curves, at the beginning, 23% of the individuals had a normal, uh, normal curve. So they weren't stressed. Um, at the end of uh, the intervention and putting those plants there, 56% were. So you can see that actually even a small amount, even a few pot plants in your house um, can make a difference. And we're going to do more work around all that, but it's, yeah, next slide, please. Um, so here are all the theories. There are different theories around cultivating your mind. Stress reduction theory, basically Ulrich really kicked all this stuff off. He basically had hospital patients um, after an operation. Uh, some of those hospital patients had a view of nature at the window. Others had a view of a brick wall. Uh, the outcome was those that had view of nature, number one, they took less medication. Number two, they were out of hospital quicker. Number three, they were, more, they were much more nicer to the nurses that were looking after them and the carers. So, you know, there's something in that. Again, we are animals. It's our habitat. Attention restoration theory. If you think about when you spot a bird or a bee, um, what happens is you look at it and you go, oh, and you're brought directly into the present, you're fascinated by it, and it takes you away, and it's, it's called an element of being away, uh, having fascination, and restoring your brain, because in the city or when you're working, your mind is constantly has this attention, whereas nature, what it allows you to do is to restore that and distract you. Prospect refuge theory um, is quite an interesting one. This was in 1975, this theory came out. Basically, what it's talking about is back to evolutionary terms. You need refuge. So, you know, to survive, um, you needed to have something that you were hidden. But at the same time, you needed prospects so you could look across and make sure nothing was coming towards you. So if you can create a garden that has that element or if you create your, your window or even in your space in your lounge or on your balcony that has an ability to enclose you, but at the same time gives you um, some view, say, through the window, then, then, then that's fabulous. Mindfulness, again, that's about bringing you into the present uh, and flow. So quite an interesting survey we did, again, during lockdown, uh, I think it was last week, 2,000 people responded to it. And what they said to us was the three activities, gardening activities that helps, has helped them most in relation to their mental health is weeding, watering and mowing. And much of that weeding is about you're in the floor. You're in that constant moment of that's what you're doing. And the other beauty of it is, is you transform things. So next slide. Um, not only that, 
Um, but when you're out in the garden, um, the sunshine hits, hits you and it creates vitamin D. So that keeps your bones, your teeth, your muscle healthy. It regulates your immune system. And also there's been a paper recently that's looked at different levels of um, different levels of sunshine, winter, autumn, and it's shown a direct link to serotonin levels, which are, are those that help with, with, with happiness. So getting outside, even if it's in, in your balcony, even if it's opening your window with, with your plant to give your plant a bit of air, is, is, is really good. Next slide. Um, and then we go on, on the physical health. Now, there is a direct link between uh, uh, physical and mental and mental health. So, um, you know, gardening can burn around 250, 500 calories. I, I did a, I pruned a hedge, a, a, a conifer hedge, and I burned, I went, I went right up on my heart rate. I probably strained it, actually, in relation to the hedging. But, you know, it's, I've got a heart monitor that I can measure, measure those things. And, and that really is um, a really good activity. So just getting out there, 15 minutes gone. In fact, there's another paper that's been produced that says, um, if you spend two hours with, in nature, that will help your, your mental well-being. We're also going to publish a paper soon that will talk about the dose response of gardening. Um, I was just looking through it today. So there's a really interesting element of how much gardening in relation to, to dosage. So yeah, next slide. Um, and here's just sort of the, you can see the, the calories burns basically with the different elements. So digging, digging 16 is quite good. Um, and, and then sort of general gardening is, is, is quite good. But there are a whole bunch of activities. Okay, we move on to the next slide. Um, and scenting of ocean, I've talked about the lavender uh, before. I mean, one of the things I've got is a... Uh, a hanging basket with a it's, a, it's a rosemary, but it's prostrate, so it dangles across and down. And to be honest, you could grow this in a tin, in a tin can with some string and, and, and pin it up or, or put it to, to the wall, or as long as you put holes in the bottom of the, of the can and have a saucer. But um, there is, um, scent is very emotive. So there's a, a, a theory called the Proustian theory. You, you may or may not have heard it, but scent, when you smell, um, basically it goes straight to the brain and, and you smell through both your mouth and your nose it goes to your brain and, and often and I'm sure you'll have had this moment there will have been a scent that has triggered you and taken you back in time instantly um, and that memory because it locks memories away and it's such a powerful um, emotive thing in fact they're using flower scent um, with people to try and retrain people who have a, a, a problem with scent um, because loss of scent is one of the biggest issues in relation to uh, senses, in relation to mental health. So, um, but you know, lavender, I, I've got uh, on Twitter, what I did is I, I asked people, tell me which plants smell of chocolate. And I've got a whole list of plants because I'm a bit of a sweet tooth with chocolate. So chocomocha, which is a, a cosmos, I've just planted that. There's another one that smells uh, of chocolate. On Sidium Sherry Baby, if you've got a little place indoors, is an orchid that when flowers smells of chocolate. Vanilla, the pod, is actually from an orchid. So, you know, it, it's that scent. And I think if you're wanting your well-being, there's an element of happiness and balance, which leads to well-being. So if you choose scents that you make you happy, then um, you, you, it will enable some of, those, some of those things to sort of make you feel, feel better. Okay, next one. Colour. So, colour, and again, both scent and colour are going to do a lot more research to work about, to create a blueprint for people's well-being, be it indoors, outdoors, on a balcony. But, you know, look at that wash of blue. Universally across the world, colour preference is blue and green. Now, the reason why it's blue and green is possibly the view is the, the sky and nature. So, those two things link that. Um, and then you go into sort of cool colours which is said to calm, and we've re we're recently doing some research looking at physiology and cool colours as opposed to hot colours. So reds and yellows are meant to excite and invigorate and, and oranges and pick you up. I mean, tulips are an amazing one. Again, a bit of a Twitter survey. Which plants do you like the best during the, this point in time? Tulips, without a doubt, and tulips are quite easy. They're bedding plants, you put them in a pot, 
uh, they come through, but you probably have to do them every year and get new tulips every year. Um, so so colour is, is important, not just the hue, so i.e. the hue of blue or green or red or yellow, but also how deeply saturated it is and also the lightness of it. And if you play around with some of those things, you can, you can actually um, manipulate how people might feel or emotion. So a classic example of that and a piece of work that's been done on yellow, if you think yellow, an emotion that might pop into your head is happiness, joy. And, and actually there's been a study that's looked at that and across 40 countries, um, yellow is associated with joy. And not only that, at the equator, it's less joyful than when you come up north, because obviously there's more sun at the equator, and as you go up, it's less. So it really is about your environment and about how you experience that. And we really not played with the scent or the colour. So let's create a happiness garden. And for some, chocolate will be horrible. They'll hate it. They'll disgust it because they'll have had a bad experience with it. But for me, a happy place would be a yellow, an orange, and a red place that would be smelling of chocolate and maybe a bit of peppermint um, and, and sort of most of that. And so think about what kind of things um, you would like. There's a lot of herbs that have those scents that you can use. They're actually chocolate-scented mint. Uh, there's a ginger-scented rosemary. Um, so there's a whole bunch of stuff out there that you could use. Okay, next slide. Um, and this just shows the colour preferences. So if you look at mean colour preference up and, and across the different colours, you can see here that the higher up, the more the colour preferences. Uh, and there is a theory called the ecological colour balance theory. And, and, and this is being used around, around looking at which of the preferences. So you can see, you know, I talked about there's more saturated blues are like more, similar with the greens and so on. So it's really, believe it or not, actually the science of colour is, is, quite, is quite new and there's still quite a little bit to do. However, a paper I think two weeks ago was published that directly correlated what people look at colour in relation to colour preference and firing neurons within the brain of certain aspects of that. So even the complexity of firing neurons in the brain is still very little understood, but there's a definite, definite connection with the areas of the brain and the firing of the brain linked to colour preference. So brain is driving the preference of which colours you like, which I think is linked to evolutionary um, survival. Next, next slide. Um, and then fractals and fascination. So um, ferns, without a doubt, you know, ferns, particularly the one on the left-hand side, uh, fractals, all they are is basically uh, the same pattern repeating itself, but it's very, very easy for us to see. So if you look at a tree, it's branched, and it's branched again, then it's branched again, then it's branched again. It just goes on and on and on. So as you're looking at it, you're processing that. It's quite easy to process, and actually it's quite calm. And you look at a fern, um, there's a fern within a fern within a fern within a fern and then you look at it it's green it's a nice green color and then um, usually it's in flecks of light and dark um, and then you have this this element so how we use this um, this element of shape is, is quite critical next slide Um, and then you've got symmetry and aesthetics. Many of us know that, you know, uh, a perfect round face and many of the magazines now completely tweak and, and make unreal people, um, which, you know, is insane. Um, and, and you look at that and you can see, you know, what is beauty? And, and it's similar with the flowers. Now, again, it depends on what flowers you like, because if you're an orchid lover, those pictures at the bottom um would probably go for the orchid on the right however most people and there's only one study that's done this um if you look at rounded perfectly rounded symmetrical flowers and you look at bilateral or, or not surrounded most will have a preference for the rounded one now i've cheated a little bit because that's a sunflower as well it's yellow so it brings us out thinking happy not everyone um so but it but it is linked to that symmetry so how we plant and select and breed plants for our future blueprint is going to be quite critical and, and uh, we need to keep as many plants as possible. There are 400,000 garden plants in this country, so we've got plenty to play with. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. 
and and of course wildlife i mean i love hedgehogs i've not seen the hedgehog in my gut i think the last time i remember seeing the hedgehog was when i was probably about i don't know 17 i was a teenager i was pretty unruly but even then i stopped and looked at the hedgehog and thought it was an amazing little creature so i think you know i think nature it does fascinate us and as i mentioned the bees and stuff but one thing that a study in Surrey showed as well is that, you know, we often do design our gardens and we, we, we bring birds into uh, the garden. But we haven't necessarily brought birds into the garden that restore us more than others. So there was a study that looked at the different types of birds. And you can see on the left hand side, number one in this study was the dunnock. Now, the dunnock doesn't look like anything it looks like a small sparrow to be honest but if you google search rspb royal society of protection of bird dunnock song and then play it it is one of the most beautiful um songs that you'll hear also multiple bird song is good as well there is some reasoning around around this but it's not proven and it'd probably be quite tricky to be proven but it's thought in one instance that if and it's a hypothesis if um, if there's plenty of bird song around, there's no predators around, which means you're safe. Um, so, and again, you know, the, the kind of songs, so magpies, not particularly liked as, as a sound. Seagulls, depends where you are. If you, if you, when I lived in Connell, seagulls on my roof, it didn't really make me feel very happy. But a lot of people might reminisce seagulls as being by the coast and, and have a good memory of, of them. But seagulls didn't come out very well in this study. So, you know, putting in bird feeders that attract dunnock, green finches, blackbirds, creating habitats for those, they're going to sing back to you and they're going to create uh, an element. Now, I only planted a little container in my little, I've got a little kennel with a clematis. It's a self watering container. I put a prop on it, I put the clematis on there, and just this morning, three little baby blue tips flew onto that one single plant and started taking the grubs off it. So it's biological control. I didn't need to use chemicals, but also it was just like a moment. Oh, look at those baby blue tits, aren't they amazing? Quick, come and see family. We all looked at it. Maybe I'm just special, but actually that was a special moment for me and, and for my family. So I think, you know, even one plant can make a difference. Okay, next slide. Um, and then, you know, I talked about sort of um, some other areas that you could create restoration. Even, and I remember as a kid, in my, I didn't have a very big house. Um, I remember as a kid getting a washing up bowl, um, burying it into the, the ground, covering it over with soil, uh, and, and just watch it. Frogs just came and had a little bits of rocks and stuff, and you know, even in the bucket. Or, you know, I mean, uh, from now, which um, even, you know, I've been a bit stressed. The last week I was a bit stressed. I spent half a day in 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 my uh, lining my little pond with clay and i was up to my thighs in uh, mud puddling the clay and boy was that was that restorative it was great both my son and my wife thought it was bonkers but actually my pond is now holding water i took it from the clay in my garden so it's sustainable and but water is really restorative and and the thing about water is um waterfalls great but, you know, we're not going to fit a waterfall on a balcony or in a house or anything. So, but even little water fountains or tiny little features can, can help or reflective spaces. So and fast water can excite and invigorate and, and slow, slow water can help for reflection. So add a water feature, even if it's a teeny weeny one that just bubbles away, it, it can add some elements. If you've got noise as well, traffic noise, you can put a water feature that's either sort of, Three, the same sound as traffic or three decibels below and it will distract you from the traffic noise. So, um, you know, using water to help um, distract. So next, next slide. And, and you know, of the 400,000 different plants, uh, Tiana Bonus, one of our research scientists, has started to look at different types of plants uh, capturing different types of pollution. And without a doubt, you know, on the right hand side, you've got scale leaves and they're best to capture the pollution in between the leaves. You've got hairy leaves, which capture them between the hairs. The waxiness can capture that. And then the rough leaves, they get captured. You can see the little images, the different particulates of the microscope. Having a hedge that's two meters high, so it stops if you're um, in relation to the car uh, elements. 
And so having a head also provides that sort of um, uh, protection. Next slide. And, and you can see, you know, again, simply on the left-hand side, you can buy these bits of kit. In fact, they use them uh, in schools. They plant them against school playground. This is basically a ready-planted ivy wall, um, and you can use it on your balcony, and you can just uh, either uh, fit it in. Sometimes you'll have to maybe fit it into a container, or you can fit it into your garden. But again, it will attract birds because it'll have berries. Uh, it will reduce sound, but it'll also um, help with the pollution. Next one. And designing for quiet. So um, it's really, this is really cool. So if I started talking to um, people in Southampton University who managed to get people to speak to each other through ocean water. So I wanted to understand, and we're still doing some more research on how, you know, often what we do is we go for building materials to design for quiet acoustic panels. Well, why are we not using greenery indoors or out? Green walls can provide acoustic um, areas. How they do it is they reflect the sound, they can absorb it, um, they can scatter it and they can diffract it. And again, I mentioned, you know, this little water feature here, that's around the sort of noise and traffic uh, that I mentioned before. But you can see the houses there. Um, if we go on to the next slide, and, and you can see, you know, this is just a bottom fern in, in a house that, that actually will absorb some of the noise. If you, if you really want to go to town and you do have the garden, that is the piece de resistance in the right hand side. Um, it's got double hedge layer. It's got grass. It's got trees tend to uh, branch out. So they do more and, it, and it's got and it's got a wall. But there's no reason why you can't get some of those elements uh, or on the balcony. Just get that great big bamboo. Not only does that um, shared out um, what might be quite an ugly mess but also uh, the leaves rustle so it creates natural sounds which like the water will distract now we still need to do more research on designing choir we know from a research paper that some plants can take out high frequencies and some plants can take out low frequencies so there's still more work to work out you know which plants are best for absorbing sound and how can we maximize that or how can we grow them or even prune them Maybe we need to prune them like this um, to actually get more, more out. So next slide. And, and phytonutrients, plant nutrients, basically. So um, in relation to when you're growing food, there's still a lot of unknowns. But there are several steps that you can take from fork in the ground or from container that you plant to fork on the plate. And one is selecting the right plant. You see the one on the left hand side at the bottom, the strawberry, this is what I, I term food scaping. So you can see the strawberry has lovely um, red petals. I've got one of those in the hanging basket. It's out my front at the moment. Uh, it's in a self watering one. It's producing those lovely red flowers. It'll also produce strawberries. So it's, it's a brutal bonus. It's giving me excitement with the color, but at the same time, it's giving me those elements. So choice of cultivar, the choice of variety that you choose will mean the type of nutrients that you will get from it. It's quite simple. Um, so for example, a green pepper might not give you as much vital nutrients or plant nutrients as a red pepper. And there are some plants that are specifically bred. So for example, there's a broccoli that's been bred called Beni Forte, which has X number of times more of a certain chemical within it that links to antioxidants and elements so tomatoes you can choose tomatoes with higher lycopene levels so what you choose is critical and there's lots of different varieties but you can look at that in relation to nutrients still more work to do from a domestic garden perspective and in a container growing the next one is then planting and growing so you can manipulate plants so tomato for example if you drought it slightly it will stress it which means it will produce more of the flavor you have to be careful you don't crack the things, but again, in this instance, on watering, less is more, and you can get more nutrients out. So how you grow can manipulate the plant. When to harvest? If you harvest at the wrong time, you won't max on the nutrients. So you need to harvest at the right time, and again, very little is really on from a domestic garden world, and that's more research needed for that. Then you move on to, you know, you, 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 you've looked at harvesting, storage. So most people put tomatoes in the fridge and apples in on the top in the room swap it around apples should be in the fridge tomatoes 
should be on the top because um, the, the challenge with those is that they actually reserve nutrients better if they're stored in that way. So broccoli, for example, one reason why broccoli in supermarkets is wrapped in cling film is because they want to hold on to the nutrients because if you unwrap that cling film, they lose the nutrients. That's why they wrap them in, in, in the plastic element, many ways to keep that. However, if you grow broccoli in a tub um, and, and you uh, harvest it immediately from your garden, you're going to get those nutrients in a second. Now, if you get that broccoli and then you cook it by boiling it, you leach all the nutrients out. So you spend all that time you've selected, you've done all of these different things, so you can either gain your nutrients or optimize your nutrients or lose them throughout the time in relation to doing that. Still a lot of work and I'm looking to try and get a fellowship, five-year fellowship student, um, looking for sponsorship to try and work out some of those things in the domestic garden. Okay, next, next slide. Um, and basically, you know, all of this, what we've got to look at is being uh, sustainable about it. So a tree isn't just a beautiful tree. Gardening isn't just about, you know, uh, ladies at leisure or, or, or gent, gentry and element. Gardening's for everyone. And every garden plant provides a multiple of benefits. What we need to do is to look at designing and having multiple benefits that benefit the environment and benefit our well-being. So flooding is a big issue. And, uh, you know, trees can take up large amounts of water. They also have soil. So you can, you know, you can change your, your runoff by having, having plants and help to protect against flooding. So next slide. And, you know, beautiful garden and beautiful environment is our habitat, basically. Now, a lot of people in the early days have talked about your garden footprint, which is quite difficult because it's about reduction. It's often negative. It's about, you know, what can I do? And treading lightly on the earth. Well, actually, you know, I'm a human. I'll, I'll tread, I, I, I can only tread because I've got the same amount of weight. I can't tread really lightly on it. But you can look to reduce what you do and make decisions in that. The more powerful thing is take action. Get your hand and take action and grow for positive change in the world. Now, I could do, personally, I could do everything in the world to be as sustainable as I possibly could, yet I wouldn't have as big an impact if I didn't uh, produce information and knowledge for our RHS members and gardeners that can take action by, for example, putting water bottles in their gardens to collect water, because all that water that's not collected goes down into the river systems, down into the streams, goes into the... Then it comes out to and so it's water being lost, whereas we can catch it to reconnect. How important what we give to it. it can oh, sorry, I'll see you. It kind of, you're kind of breaking up a little bit. All right. Um, yeah. Sorry, we got you back. That's good. All right. So, um, so if you want to create your well-being space, here's some top ten tips. Add plants. Uh, if it's one plant in a tiny little pot, um, to you know, if you've got a massive space, you're probably already surrounding yourself with plants. But choose plants that that, that you like. Um, Top up your vitamin D, even if it's, you know, opening the window or, or going, you know, going out for, for a walk in nature or even um, going out in the public spaces, which um, more and more are becoming available for us to be able to do to do that. Um, if you to top up your vitamin D, if you can't do that, enjoy plants indoors or on, on, on your balcony. Sense on the brain, choose scents that you like. Uh, and, and that give you things that you like and surround yourself with them. Choose plants that are easy to grow. Lavender is very, very easy outdoors. Um, it's such an easy, it's so basic. You plant it, put it in a pot, water it, give it some nutrients, give it a haircut once a year, uh, and then it'll give, it'll give back. It also attracts bees and butterflies and things, so you'll, you'll get some nurture in. Harness the power of color. You know, look around your house, your room, or whatever colors you're using. 
and, and you know, make a palette board of the colors that you like, choose things, and then choose those because you're surrounding yourself with things you like. And, and, and that will help you to feel happy. Fractal shape and symmetry. Get a fern, get some ferns. They're amazing. And um, they're green, they're, they're, they're just drop you. In, in, in a way that I just cannot explain. And, and, I, and at some point, I really do want to look at the neurology of when people look at a whole mass of ferns, um, because there's something that triggers linked to that pattern, that simple pattern and that ease of looking at the green. Um, welcome in wildlife. Uh, I think welcome in the, the, the clay pond I mentioned today. I've had a crow, a magpie, a blue tit, a robin, all having a little drink from that. It's only been in. For, for a short amount of time and, and, and much nature is using lots of flies and even, even a dragonfly. Next door had a heron, so I'm hoping the heron will come in, but I'm not putting fish in. I'm just gonna have frogs and tadpoles because tadpoles are cool as well. Um, which leads to the restorative effects of water. Remember plants can be done for pollution and noise busters as well. Grow your own food. Most easiest plant and most easiest giver that I would say that you could grow is strawberries. Without a doubt, you will get strawberries. Order strawberries, buy them. You'll be eating strawberries in a few weeks' time. Just got one thing I can show you. And I'm a bit of a geek, so as you've probably noticed, I like plants. Um, this is on my kitchen. Okay, so this is an LED um, growing system. I'll just unplug the light. It grows... Um, it grows in water. It grows in water, so it's all hydroponically. There's no soil. It sits on my kitchen sink, and I have I've been harvesting this lettuce since February, uh, and I keep just harvesting it. I feed it. It aerates itself. It's called an aero garden. Uh, there are a number of these types of gardens. I've got another couple in my garage because I'm a bit of a geek about about tech and stuff. And that's an IKEA growing system. And I've got lettuce coming out of my ears in relation to that. I started that in January. Um, so I'm not short of lettuce, but I've got too much at the moment. Um, so I need to grow some other plants. But yeah, you know, so that's, I think, I think that's it. In, in a man, just, you know, um, it, it, just on a serious note, I don't think, if I didn't have gardening, I don't, I don't think uh, it would, I'd, I don't think I'd be able to live a life that I live because it helps me every day in relation to who I am. And, you know, I, I, am, I know I'm different to many people, but I embrace that difference and I use gardening to really help me. And I think you'll find a lot of gardeners, um, which is why when I talk to them, we're very, very similar, um, have that same feeling. And the majority of gardeners are givers and, and they care very much about people and they care very much about the natural environment and 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 we're a bit bonkers to be honest but on a serious note gardening is underpinned by a, a huge amount of evidence now um yes there's correlations but there are also rcts so if a doctor says to you or doctors out there if you're listening you think oh god prescribing gardening that's a bit of a cop out well, actually, it really isn't. It actually will make a difference. And, and, I, and I've chatted to the ex-Queen physician, uh, Sir Richard Thompson, about this, and he's really passionate about it, and he absolutely gets it. And the more, and, and you know, the lead for mental health, Tim, is, is fully on board in relation to understanding the role that gardening can do from a physical, mental, and social. So it's helped me... Um, you might disagree, it hasn't helped me, but it's helped me and I'm sure it's going to help um, you. At the same time, it's not for everyone. So, you know, I think you've got to choose what, what floats your boat, but, you know, don't knock it, give it a try. If it's not for you, fine. That, that, that you know, I, I, I just want to really give this out as a gift because I, 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 it's helped me all my life. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Ad. That's absolutely amazing. And, and it, not only is, is, is the, is, are your arguments well established in science but you're so passionate about it and and you just want to share that with other people and and honestly for that i absolutely applaud you and at the same time i'm i'm so embarrassed about the fact that we in our practice you know have done lots of different things and we've tried different stuff and some work some don't but gardening is not something that we've really you know 
pushed as or, or uh, highlighted or and and it and actually the, the the case when when you've made it as you have is so powerful and and there's also a big drive now for social prescribing as you mentioned um i think i think that is definitely something that we as a practice are going to go away and work really hard and to to, to kind of try to raise the profile not just with our practices but but more widely as well and um for there are a few questions and i'll I'll come to those in just a moment we've run a bit over time but i think this is absolutely worth i'm really sorry Um, i I ranted on a bit sorry the the interesting thing is that i i i I, I love the the idea of like plants as natural barriers and so we're in west london so we've got a 380s so so a380s uh, wheels clipping our chimneys as they land at Heathrow so 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 actually those ideas around um, water and uh, reducing pollution and noise are, are, are something that are, is particularly relevant relevant to us but also one of the other interesting thing was that you mentioned was about kind of the the, 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 the impact of the senses in, you know maybe to think of plants not as plants but as like art and living wall and and just kind of all of these things that you've kind of mentioned are um sort of a really interesting take on 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 what i perceived gardening as before before we met um just for for patients there's there's two things actually the one is that we're going to start a volunteer program with Northwest London, and and one of the things we thought we'd do is to try to support patients with helping use more digital technology. But actually, I think we should include something around gardening and um, and um, well-being. And that would be really good to get your input on on, on that, Alistair. And and also, we're moving premises, as many of you are aware, and I think many practices are. You know, don't really use flowers and plants, and actually, um, CQC regulations are, are are there, but I'm sure there are ways around that, and I'm, I'm, I think it'd be amazing yeah. for both the staff and patients to. There have- definitely are. Yeah, I mean, I don't know whether you've heard of so so more hospital. Well, Kingston Hospital, I walked around there um, not so long ago, had plants in the hospital, which mm. is really forward thinking. Um, because you know they're not alien. I think a lot of people plants are alien to them. It's like oh god, don't know what to do. Um, Horatio's garden, so they actually have uh, hospital beds out in gardens um, linked link to linked to work. Uh, Tower Hamlets is doing some really good work. There are at least six GPs now in the country, and the more GPs we can get prescribing gardening and and doing it because I believe that it will it will help uh, a, a lot of people don't necessarily in some instances obviously you do need the drugs but in in many cases you might not um and i think you just need that support around you so that, and the social prescribing stuff um there are more and more a garden so in the garden at, uh, up north manchester bridgewater um we've got a social and therapeutic garden that we've designed and uh, we've got patients going through through that um linked with salford university so yeah, there's the, there's definitely more stuff uh, coming online, but the more that can be done, yeah. um, I think I think the better. I think I think your the, the research around it's taken me the, ten years of, it's of research ten, and well, it's ten years well spent, Alistair. Uh, it's interesting how the, the research about gardening being uh, productive and useful and, and changing moods and behaviour is, as you say, is well established. But it's, uh, it's interesting in your presentation that it, it appears now to have moved on to sort of using plants as you know, drugs, basically. Like if you're talking about a dose response curve, that's a, a methodology that is used in, in therapeutics for medication. And you've measured cortisol, which is a, a stress hormone, as you mentioned, which, you know, it, it, it's interesting. It will be really interesting to look at basically whether we can control patients' blood pressures, whether we can reduce their medication um, by using plant therapy, and and actually, kind of, 
or whether we can delay initiating treatments in the first instance by, you know, gardening. I, I, th I think to think of it as, you know, as, as another tool in, 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 in the work that we do in primary care is, is, a, is a really interesting area for, for, for research. I think I think certainly I mean it's really true I mean again I just hark back to us being I know a lot of people many people would like it but we're, we're animals and if animals are stressed um, usually they're stressed because they're not in the right environment and and it's not just the environment of other people around yes there are threats and, and there are others but it's also the environment that we have in in our situation so certainly one of the things that we're championing very much is around uh, certainly the planning side of things to make sure that planning be it um, balconies be it you know high-rise flats be it any any development needs to think about creating an individual space for individual people because community gardening is good and and does a lot of good but often it, it, it's also having that ability to have your own space your own control um, and to feel in control and and to not worry that you know and so so I think yeah it's it's a preventative natural health care um, so designing gardens or designing blueprints for well-being which plants how many plants and how to interact with those plants to optimize the preventative stuff um, but yeah it, it's just finding the uh, the action so finding more people more doctors others actually starting to just to do it well, I think that's why your book is particularly good, actually, because it doesn't overwhelm you, but it does give you some ideas some something. So it is a, a starter for a blueprint to get you involved. I've got a couple of quick questions. We've completely lost track of time. So we are we are on time, right. not, not in this country. <laughs> so <laughs> <we'll have> to, <laughs> so we, we've moved to different times, and I think we can still stick to the 19 minutes. But honestly, every word you've mentioned is... Is, is, a, is a pearl of wisdom and, and it's just been fascinating. So, so thank you very much. Um, a couple of quick fire questions to finish off. Um, thank you to all the patients who've held on in there. I'm sure you've got things to do, but um, we will make this available later on and, and we'll send you links and things. So uh, if you've missed bits, you can always come back. So a couple of quick questions uh, answered. So is it safe to visit garden centres? Uh, as long as you as long as you do good social distancing yeah um it, it, it is safe i went to a garden center last week i was just very very careful actually i wore i, I wore a mask um, and that's up to you whether you want to do that or not but i i did um and then i you know i got my compost which is i was desperate for and then i got home and washed my hands and and just took took, took precautions so I, yeah i mean i think and do help our industry at the moment has really struggled because of the scenario of, of you know lots of plants uh, not being able to get and, and people not being able to, to obtain them you can still get stuff online as well so if you're really nervous uh, the, I think the pressure of garden centers opening will mean that online stuff might come through quicker yeah and then I might echo that sentiment I think you need to take precautions but actually it's well worth a visit and um, and Personally, I think just visiting local garden centres, perhaps the independent ones in particular, would them. be would help to help the, sustain the local economy as well. Um, do, do you eat? Uh, do you think eating lavender helps sleep better? Oh, that's um, there was there was um, there was a study, and I don't think it came out conclusive. So lavender biscuits. And I think there was one that also looked at it. So I, I think that's uh, possibly inconclusive. What I do know is that there are certain tablets that are prescribed with a certain amount of, um, of, of the right ingredients from the lavender that, that absolutely do. Um, so, and I do also know that burning essential oil um, has, has uh, a positive effect in relation to sleep uh, or having the real thing, having the flowers, but I'm not, I'm not sure in relation to eating. It's, it's something that uh, I didn't, I didn't come across a huge amount, um, on that. I mean, I've never seen lavender on a menu, but you know, unless it's a really posh, um, restaurant where they 
give you edible flowers. Yeah, they do, they do do like lavender <laughs> biscuits and like I've tried them. They're they're, they're, they're sort of an acquired yes. You, you won't push over the edge. Yeah. There's some some other questions about which plants smell nice, which ones reduce stress, and um, which ones will encourage birds. I think you covered some of those in your presentation, but actually there are some really good ideas where you give specific names of plants uh, within your book so that's probably the best place for it there's a question here which says um, what types of plants don't encourage insects to come near i think i think you would argue you do want insects to come don't you yeah i, th I think I, I think so i mean it depends on what insects that you you don't particularly want i mean we're really really lucky in the uk we have very few that are immensely problematic unless obviously you you have a big issue with 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 bees and wasps and 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 you know allergic reactions to them so um and and we're not in places like malaysia where there are massive i mean i've been in malaysian rainforest are leeches and snakes and spider webs that you really don't want to bounce into um but i i i think you have to tolerate a little bit of of of, of wildlife um if if you're going to bring some of the plants. Many indoor plants don't tend to oh, sorry. Um, that you can manage. Sorry, we lost you there a bit, but that's fine. So, um, which types of plants don't need lots of light? Right. And watered regularly, you've you've mentioned a few in your talk today. Um, this is an interesting one. Um, I wonder if you just give some pointers, and I, and I think we as a practice will definitely be pushing this as uh, um, giving you ideas of where you can go locally but but somebody said um what's the best way to make a start are there any co courses that you can join or any 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 resources that you can think of where somebody might well, other than picking up this fabulous book yeah i mean i think i think so go on to the rhs website there's loads and loads of information there loads of free information there um about growing stuff uh, start easy. There's there's a campaign for school gardening information on the RHS website, which is geared up um, to teachers. So um, it helps. It really explains things in in, in a really easy way um, to to get growing. Start with things that are really really simple. Go with plants that are awarded garden merit AGMs because they're they're difficult to kill, and <laughs> and you know I think go go with things that um, you know peace lily. Uh, Spathifilum, uh, well, it's the other peace lily. Um, it's something I mentioned to you. It's the, it's the one that's in Hot Fuzz, um, as as the movie, and he looks after his peace lily. But that that is a really good and very easy plant to have have indoors. Parlor palms, they're really easy to look after as well. So, I think it's a matter of just you know looking for plants that are they're really easy. This this wall behind me has got uh, a fern in it. Called a uh, Splenium scolopendrium, sorry the, the the Latin name, but it it, it you know it tolerates uh, moisture, it tolerates drought, and that's why it's in this this plant box here. This from Biotecture, it's a green wall thing. Um, it, it 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 has its own reservoir, so it, it it grows very 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 easily. Succulents in the house as well, and a lot of succulents are quite easy to look after. Cacti, they're pretty bit. Pretty, a bit prickles but uh there are some that yeah so i think just yeah really it's just start with some of the simple plants thank you i see yeah that i just finally realized that what you have behind you is is technically a green screen in zoo <laughs> yes I might, I might get a green screen and just have plants on it but <laughs> well, you should be promoting real green yes plants and real green screens this is a kind of interesting-ish one and the last one for us today thank you everybody um, um so plants will plants release carbon dioxide at night and take in oxygen and if so um will it will it result in a deficiency of oxygen in the room in which case should we not have them in the bedroom while sleeping fantastic question so over the past uh four years we've been doing some research on house plants because we wanted to resolve that issue uh, that people have talked about and it really is about right plant right place right purpose yeah that uh, once we crack those elements and it's understanding how to do that with the four hundred thousand plants a lot of work to do in the next 10 years however um, what we found was that things like the mother-in-law's tongue, Sansevieria, doesn't give out CO2 at night. 
So you can have you can select some plants that don't do that. Um, and actually, the, the amount that they give in the night is very, very little compared to what we're doing. Now, we've, we've also calculated the number of plants that you would need in a room, uh, and it will depend on the number of plants. And in many cases, you would need, you know, 20, 30 or 40 plants to make a difference. But again, I think through breeding and selection, but also growing with lights, you, you can make a big difference. Just recently, um, we've also and discover this will published in the next couple of months that um, the plants will take out nitrogen uh, nitrogen dioxide. So they actually take, take, take that out. So the answer is if you get the right plants, maybe um, like I talked about the, the mother-in-law's tongue um, uh, and their other sort of succulents, then they won't give out uh, that the, the element of um, CO2. And, and, and stuff. In many, in many ways, if you get the growing conditions right, you'll end up with a much better uh, environment with higher oxygen levels. Yeah. Aside of that, there are other studies that have shown even if you do have those levels, the mental well-being impacts of having those plants in your gardens overrides that other aspect um, because it's so little uh, in relation to that. But yeah, I mean, have a, have a look. There's, uh, if you want to research gate, there's a publication that we've uh, published and it's about plants and buildings. Um, it's such, uh, um, my name and, and, and those things, you'll come up with it and you can read it. So plants and building systems. And there, there haven't been any cases have there where the harm has been caused by, demonstrated to be caused by plants in, in, in the bedroom other than the triffids. No, <laughs> yeah. Other than that, um, the, the, only, the, only, the only other thing is there, there have been, and they're very rare, but occasional uh, poisoning incidents linked to berries being eaten of specific plants. Yes. Um, particularly that one that's at Christmas, you have the red berries on that one. But yeah. you know, they are so few and far between. The majority of plants um, don't 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 do that. That you know they're, they're, they're safe. But you can't you can't hide the fact that there are some some instances where there, there are challenges you just got another plan so your your final thank you so much uh so, so your final tip is have your mother-in-law's tongue in your bedroom <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, oh dear <laughs> i think that's if we weren't one hour over our 19 minutes then we'd have to terminate anyway so i'm glad you didn't mention that at the beginning Thank you so, so, so much for all your time. I, for one, have learned loads and loads and loads. And, and, and as I said before, I think this has been a transformative experience for me. Um, and, I, and I hope that, you know, I'll spread the work that you're doing. I think it's absolutely remarkable. And, um, and we'll, we'll do everything we can for our patients. So thank you once again, Asif, for, for everything. And, um, and all your handy hints and all your cool. Sorry about that. Yes, um, thank, thank, and thanks for, very much for letting me sort of share this uh, with people. And you know, just 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 give it a go. And I know if it's not for you, it, it's not for you. That's fine. Um, I think I think you know, and and just take it take it steady as as you go and, and start easy. And just remember that you know. Failure will be an option and you will fail, but actually you will, you will also get some gratification when you, you do get success. Um, yeah, someone obviously wants to get told them. Right. Thank you so much. Take care. All right. All right. Take care. Bye now. Bye. Bye. Bye.